It's time for Good Game Spawn Point. Are you ready yet, guys? Almost. Almost. Great, because coming up on the show, we try out some crazy new multiplayer games, starting with the Splatoon-style racing of Trailblazers. And we'll try to vaporize each other in Laser League. Yes! Plus, Rad meets up with a cool young coder, Sarah Yep. Okay, Jem, we're all set up and ready to play. On your marks, get set! Whoa. Two, one! Oh. Oh. I'm in the wrong paint. I'm definitely in the wrong paint. I'm spending a lot more time on the grass than I am on the track. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I missed that turn entirely. No, 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 no! Oh, oh. I can't control oh. the Why are you racing like this, Jeff? Yes, yes, yes! Wall, the wall, <laughs> the wall. That was not a shortcut. Whoa, spin out. Yeah! Uh, Trailblazers is a cooperative arcade racer by developer Supergog, which sees you battling it out for a top spot on the leaderboard in a weird sort of mashup between Splatoon and Wipeout. There are a total of 10 tracks to race on with eight different modes to master. The aim of the game is to paint the track with your team colours. Driving on these paint trails will allow you and members of your team to boost. The more trails you hit, the higher your boost combo and the faster you'll go. It also makes it harder for the opposing team to get ahead of you because they'll have to spend more time painting in order to gain back ground. If you're in the lead, you'll be focusing on breaking up enemy paint trails while also laying down your own. Having these down in the early laps means that should someone fall behind, they can catch up while also fixing up any trails broken by the opposition. I really liked how this mechanic kept me on my toes. I was always thinking and looking for a chance to advance my team. I agree, the push and pull system is really engaging, but it was undercut by the vehicle design. While they do look really cool in their sci-fi anti-grav glory, they handle like a walrus on a unicycle. Each car is ranked according to its paint capacity, boosting and handling, but I found they all felt equally clunky and difficult to control. I found it was the drifting that really threw me off. The slightest tap of the brake can kill your momentum and throw you off course, which can cost you precious seconds in a close race. It made navigating those tight corners feel more like a game of chance than a test of skill. Crashing into the barricades and other was also a massive nuisance. It's like a game of dodge em cars, but not the fun kind. I found particularly after unleashing a paint attack on an opponent, instead of their car being thrown out of the way, they'd stop right in the middle of the track, almost always causing a collision. It's not only jarring, but irritating, as colliding with anything cancels out the point bonus you had going. The clumsy AI doesn't help much either. Right? I don't claim to be the world's best driver, but clearly none of these guys have ever passed a driving test. Trailblazers also features a single-player campaign that introduces you to the colourful cast. While this mode is mainly here to familiarise you with the controls and the courses, it does a good job of breaking up the constant racing with some fun back-and-forth banter. I don't know, the characters all felt a bit dull to me. I mean, they are given the occasional funny line or quip, but most of their interactions can just be summed up with, I need to beat this person for reason, let's race. Yeah, I agree, they're all fairly bland. Although, you must admit they do have a cool look about them. All style and no substance. The whole game has a really vibrant 90s space look to it, and combined with an awesome techno soundtrack, it gives the world enough personality that I can kind of forgive the characters for being a bit lacking. Ah, that's all well and good, but a racer is only as good as its track design. What did you guys think? I didn't think the tracks themselves were all that special. Even with the impressive range of environments, there isn't a lot of variety. A few sharp turns and the occasional obstacle isn't much of a challenge when you think about what games like Mario Kart 8 have delivered. I think that's my biggest problem with Trailblazers. We've had so many great racing games in recent years that new releases need to live up to those top titles, and this is a backward step. Yeah, that's probably true, but I think I liked the courses because they weren't overly complicated. It meant that I could focus on laying my paint trails in the areas I knew would give me the best boosts. An overly complicated track with too many twists turns and shortcuts would have made navigating and strategizing way too hard to juggle. Although they could have included a mini-map so I knew where I was in relation to everyone else. Final thoughts, guys? I think Supergonk should be commended for trying to bring such a unique concept to life, combining the fast-paced world of racing with strategic territory control. I just don't think it worked as well as it could have here. I'm giving Trailblazers two and a half out of five rubber chickens. Yeah, while those controls can be a little bit funky, I think they blended the two styles really well, and I enjoyed the fast-paced nature of the races as I strategized on the go. I'm giving it three out of five rubber chickens. I really didn't like this. While I can appreciate 
create the unique art style, and I loved the idea, I can't look past the dodgy controls and uninspired track design. I'm giving Trailblazers two out of five rubber chickens. I kind of feel like playing Wipeout now. I kind of feel like playing Splatoon. I'm Squid, I'm Kid, I'm Squid Kid. Okay, so I asked Darren to lend me a hand with the scoop, but this is not what I had in mind at all. Uh, I guess I'm ready to dig in and scoop up some gaming news. First up, a new record has been set for the Atari 2600 game Barnstorming, after a speedrunner made use of a wicked glitch. The Barnstorming game mode, known as Hedgehopper, challenges players to fly through 10 barns without crashing. The glitch in question involves hitting the roof of the first barn in a precise spot several times, skipping the barn counter forward. It was thought to be impossible without the help of tool-assisted play. But speedrunner Ertzatz Katz was able to achieve it using an original console and barnstorm his way into the record books. Not to mention establishing a new glitched speedrun category. I guess a glitch in time saves time. Next up, Akram Digital, a Polish indie developer and publisher, has had its games removed from Steam due to some bogus reviews. Akram's board game adaptations, 8 Minute Empire and Steam, Rails to Riches, were both pulled by Valve following an investigation. Valve found an Akram staff member had been trying to inflate users' scores by posting multiple positive reviews under different accounts. So Valve said, screw him, Akram, go on, get... Well, not really. The staff member, Greja Gosh Kubas, apologised and took full responsibility for the incident. But Valve, who own the Steam platform, says it will no longer do business with him. Moving on, competitors from the Super Smash Bros. Invitational Tournament at this year's E3 have been announced. Nintendo has selected eight players from around the world, including the winner of the 2014 E3 Smash Bros. Invitational, Zero. But it will be somewhat of an even playing field, as all contestants will be playing the new Switch version of the game for the very first time. All this builds even more excitement for one of the year's most anticipated Switch releases from Nintendo. Smashing! And finally, you may have heard of the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, but what about the Google Chrome update that broke the audio of browser games? I think that's just as catchy. A recent Chrome update, which was designed to stop web page ads from loudly autoplaying, had the unintended effect of disabling audio in many web-based games. Developers of games such as Steven Sausage Roll and Super Hexagon were affected, as well as devs using HTML5 and some other common web game engines. Despite Google rolling back the update, it left the developer community a bit miffed. Getting over it, Bennett Foddy was amongst those voicing their concern about the issue. Wow, something even more aggravating than actually playing getting over it. And now it's time for something a bit extra. It's the extra scoop. All sorts of cool Nintendo Labo creations have been popping up online since its launch. Like this inventive use of the motorcycle Joy-Con from a Japanese inventor, used here to power a 13-year-old boy's wheelchair. Now that's some outside-the-box thinking. If you've got something you think would make a good extra scoop, send it here. Ah, OK, um, I, I don't know what... D Darren, um, got something of yours? Ah, I love the beach. The sand, the surf, the sun, the flags, the rips. Ooh. The beach can be a pretty dangerous place sometimes. But luckily for us, there's a super smart 10-year-old developer who's made a beach safety app so that we can all enjoy the fun without any of the trouble. I'm going to go catch up with her right after I catch one of these waves. You must be Sarah, the 10-year-old app developer who made the beach safety app. Can you tell me some things about coding? Yeah. How did you get into making apps? Um, I went to Code Camp and I really enjoyed it. After three days, I had made an app and then I wanted to keep doing it. Just three days? That's incredible. How old were you when you started? I was nine years old when I started making nine. apps. What was it about coding that drew you to it? It looked really fun and um, it looked like you could do lots of things with it. And so I wanted to try it. Is that what you like, the ability to do anything and use your imagination and be creative? Yeah. I think Spawnlings like that they can tell their own stories uh, within the games that they make themselves. So, you know, we've had the most insane stories coming out of our camps. Sometimes we have, you know, unicorns on a secret mission through a haunted castle. Sometimes we have aliens in a mission to outer space. You know, it could be anything. <laughs> Why did you decide to make a beach safety app? 
Um, because in Australia there's um, lots of people that go to the beach and some people don't know the rules of the beach. Sarah's right. With an estimated 2.2 million people visiting Bondi Beach alone every year, people need to know the dangers. And that's why her app has really made a splash. If somebody goes to the beach and they don't know, like, what a rip is, and they could get caught in one and they could be in trouble. Absolutely. That's cool. So you just want to help people. How does it feel to have made something that might actually save people's lives? That's pretty big. I feel really proud because I didn't know I could do something like that. Do you think that games are a good way to learn things and teach things? Yeah, because um, if you had just a piece of information, people might think it's boring and not read it, um, even though it's really helpful. But if you had a game, um, they would think it's fun and they would, like, learn from it. And um, with games, you can keep playing them. Do you think more kids should be making apps? Yeah, I think they should be making apps because it's really fun and um, you can help people by making them. What kind of programs do you like to use when you're coding? I use block coding, which is where you drag and drop, but I also use JavaScripting, which is where you write um, the code. I find student numbers are growing. We get more and more enrolments every single season in our holiday camps and more kids wanting to get involved. It's pretty exciting that they can envision themselves creating things. We will definitely see coding as a core subject in schools. It's started to be embedded into the curriculum, into the syllabus, and they're not gonna have a choice pretty soon. So you're gonna be a future game dev, do you think? Or well, you are a game dev now, but do you think that you wanna do that as a career? Yeah, I wanna be a coder and code lots of things. Since Sarah is such a pro at making her beach safety app, I thought I might get some safety tips for some other app ideas I had. Making a cheese toasty. Um, be careful not to burn yourself. That's true. Cheese can get very hot. Playing a video game with friends. Don't get, like, too competitive and start, like, hurting somebody. That's a very good point, as you can get really into it and then get angry and you have to make sure that you don't do that. Taking a perfect selfie with a cat. Cats can sometimes get, like, cranky, so, like, make sure the cat's happy. Yeah, that's true. They can get cranky, can't they? Hosting a TV show with an AI that might have dreams of taking over the world. Don't let them take over the world. <laughs> yeah, you know what I would say? Unplug them. <laughs> so what should spoilings do if they want to get started making their own apps? There's plenty of resources that they could start with online. Coding is not the kind of thing that you're going to maybe be awesome at straight away, but it's something that you've got to just keep trying and keep trying to figure things out because one day it's just going to click and then you'll be able to do anything that you want to do with technology. So it's a persistence thing? Persistence. Persistence pays off for sure. What advice would you have for kids who maybe want to start coding themselves? Um, have fun and, like, um, you can do anything. The beach is a huge part of Australian culture. As an island nation, we're surrounded by them. So it's really cool to see someone as young as Sarah not only making apps, but using them to make the world a bit of a safer place. Definitely makes the beach more approachable. The time has come once again for us to get a bit questiony. Oh, and what better way to get questiony than with some Ask SP questions? Well, first up, we have a very fluffy video question from Nibbles. Hi, GGSB. I'm Nibbles, the elite gaming bunny. I have three questions for you. One, how much does Terraria cost on PS4? Two, what's the best way to get legendary characters on PVZ Garden Warfare 2? Three, what's your fave Switch game? Thanks. Also, if you don't answer, I will chew your cables. Ah, thank you, Nibbles. That's the second bunny we've had on Ask SP this year. There sure are a lot of gaming bunnies out there who watch the show with some great questions. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about the threat of chewed cables, though. Keep those bunny teeth away from my chargers and HDMI's, you rascally rabbit. Oh, well, calm down, Goose. It's OK. Let's just give Nibbles the answers and uh, nobody gets chewed. So, Nibbles, my bunny buddy, in answer to your first question about how much Terraria is on PS4, well, the cost of the game will depend on where you're purchasing it from, so it's best to check directly with the outlet. 
I've seen it for around $10 to $20 or so on the digital store, depending on if there's a sale, but it will probably cost a little bit more for a physical copy. Sometimes you can pick up pre-owned physical copies of games for cheaper than full price too. So shop around for the best deal. Now, in answer to your question about getting legendary characters on Plants vs Zombie Garden Warfare 2, these are unlockable using sticker packs purchased with in-game Plants vs Zombies coins. Yes, but it can take a while to build up your coins in the game, especially if you want to avoid buying them with real money. And the chances of getting legendary characters are quite rare. Another way is to engage Infinity Time, a mode that becomes available once you've completed enough story quests for either Team Plants or Team Zombies. If you manage to gather at least 25,000 time shards during this mode, you should receive a legendary character sticker from the Infinity Chest you get at the end. As for the best way, well, it depends on if you're confident getting 25,000 shards on Infinity Mode or how easily you manage to collect those in-game coins. On to your last question about our favourite Switch game. It's so hard to choose just one. Um, my fave Switch exclusive is probably Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. I love the strategy, it's really colourful, very smart game. But I also really like Overcooked, because it's a fun one to play portably, like uh, uh, overcooking things with my friends. Yeah, for me it's probably Splatoon 2. It's got such replayability. I'm always coming back to the Salmon Run mode, and I think Nintendo have done a great job at supporting it with updates. Plus, it appeals to my competitive side. But you know, my favourites are constantly evolving. Evolving like Pokemon! And speaking of Pokemon, we have a question here from Glacian Queen. GGSP, do you know any good Pokemon games for the iPhone? If you do not owl, sir, my drones will replace you forever! Rad, do these! Whee! <laughs> I am not sure if they do anything. Thanks, Glaceon Queen. <sighs> oh, I see. There are a few different Pokemon games available for iPhone that we could suggest. But look, I don't think we could ever truly be replaced by drones. Mm. It's hard to match our razzle dazzle, our wit, our um. Je ne sais quoi. Oh, bless you. But on to your question. Good Pokemon games for iPhone. Oh, what would you say, Goose? Uh, I'd say Pokemon Go is probably the most fun. It's hugely popular too. But it does use a lot of in game transactions and involves visiting real life locations for certain things. So, one to run by the grown-ups. Indeed. Then there's Pokemon Camp, which has a bunch of cute Pokemon-themed minigames and collectibles. Younger gamers in particular might like this one. Oh, and let us not forget Pokemon Duel. It's a bit clunky, but there's some good strategy there. Most of these are free initially, so you can always give them a try. See what you think. Okie dokie, moving on to one more question, and it's from... Magment. My... my... Magment? Uh, who is inside Goose's head? Inside my head? Uh, what are you doing in there? It's dangerous. Stay out of the corners of my mind. I have two questions. One, why hasn't Unknown Worlds released Subnautica on the Xbox One? Two, do you know when the Arctic DLC come? Hashtag Darren do these. Oh, I'll just get Darren on the horn. We have a horn? Ah, uh, sorry. Oh. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, hi, Darren. Uh, quick emojis for you to do here. <clears throat> Stare. Yeah. Beauty spot. Oh, well done. Thanks, Darren. Now, while you're here, do you know why Unknown Worlds hasn't released Subnautica on the Xbox One yet? Well, Goose, while Subnautica was officially released via Steam earlier this year, the Xbox One version is still technically considered to be in early access. Updates and patches are generally being made available for both versions, so the features and gameplay are still very similar, but the latest official word from the developers is that they aren't 100% ready to formally launch the game on Xbox One. They say they have more work to do on the game's performance and stability for that platform. And uh, what about the Arctic DLC for Subnautica? Do you know when that will come? Some kind of Arctic-themed DLC or icy biome is definitely an idea that has been floated. Floated? Like, say, perhaps um, an iceberg? Affirmative, Rad. Icebergs are known to float. Uh, there has been some indication from the developers that a paid expansion is likely at some stage, so this Arctic-themed DLC could be a part of that. But for now, nothing's guaranteed or officially announced. Yeah, I sure hope they don't leave us out in the cold on that one. I concur, even though I lack the human nerve endings to experience cold temperatures. Mm. Uh, well, speaking of nerve endings, I'm going to end this call with you now, Darren. Goodbye. Oh, the nerve! And on that note, it's time to wrap up. But if you've got a question that you'd like to send us, blip on over here. Blip indeed. And send us a video too. We like those. What is blipping? Blip. All right, are you feeling focused? Laser focused. Then it's time for Laser League. 
Xena, Xena, Xena. Oh, what's oh. going on? Oh, no! No! Ah. 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 Well, that went well. <laughs> okay, that was over quickly. Oh! Mm. Brutal. Yep, that was me. Watch out for the slasher. Bam! Ooh, this... <gasps> yeah, slasher got me. Yep. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, oh! Thank you very much. Critical point. Here we go. Let's do it. Okay, come on. Yes! Go, go team Xenon. <laughs> Laser League is a neon-fueled futuristic sports multiplayer game by developer Roll7, who also made the cool skateboarding game Oli Oli. The goal in Laser League is simple. You have to eliminate all the enemy players and be the last person standing. And you do that by using your abilities and laser walls. You activate the walls by running through nodes, which create a neon wall of your team's colour. Each map has a different pattern of walls that slide and spin as they try to catch you out. You can pass through your own laser walls, but touch one of the enemy ones and you're funzo dunzo. You can customise your character with one ability and one perk. Perks change depending on what ability you choose and do things like speed up your ability charge time. And it's those abilities themselves where the fun begins. They add more strategy and tension to the game and include things like teleporting or stuns. My personal favourite is the Slash. This lets you sprint forward and take out an enemy with one hit. I really liked the node steal. Nice laser wall you got there. It'd be a shame if someone were to steal it. Laser League is a purely multiplayer experience that you can either play locally or online. Personally, though, I love a bit of couch co-op. There's nothing better than being able to enjoy the excitement with your buddies next to you. Yeah, sure thing, buddy. There's just something great about being able to talk and jostle with your teammates or your opponents. Come on, yeah, got one left. I got one left on their side. We'll get him, we'll get him, we'll get him. Stan! Stan looking. Stan, here it comes. Oh! oh Stan! Yes! 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 The game is better the more people you have playing. 1v1 is quite tense, but throw a few extra players into the mix and now you have a mix of abilities on each team. Plus, you can revive teammates. This makes games longer, more challenging and much more tense. And if you can't find more humanoid players to join your game, you can always rely on the ever-helpful presence of artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, because luckily the AI in Laser League is really good. What do you mean, luckily? You say that as though not all AI is superior and should always be the first choice for maximum gaming efficiency. I think what she meant is that we're lucky to have an AI in the first place. Yeah, it's such an honour, Darren. Uh, oh, of course. Uh, I am honourable indeed. <laughs> the only downside to having so many characters on screen at once is it can be hard to see where you are, as each player is indicated by a small coloured outline of a triangle. But getting a handle on things when they're so frantic is part of the challenge. Plus, it's easy to just jump in. The controls are really straightforward and the objectives are clear. The gameplay is so pure that pretty much anyone can get a handle on this really quickly. Plus, they do such a great job of making you actually feel like a futuristic sports star. Each match starts with sweeping shots of a giant sports arena with hundreds of cheering fans and every team has a cool neon line art logo. The extra detail of having different teams and different logos actually does a lot to help the action feel grounded. Totally! It feels real and that ups the ante. All in all, I had a lot of fun playing Laser League. It's fairly simple in concept, but it's executed really well. I'm giving it three and a half out of five rubber chickens. Yeah, this is a really well-designed multiplayer and I think it's the sort of game that's going to be around for some time. I'm giving it three and a half as well. Guys, I hope sports in the future are actually more like this. I had a blast. I'm giving it four out of five rubber chickens. All right, time for one more match. Team Z Ooh, okay. Oh, actually, we're the other team now. Boo, Team Xenon! Boo! Ooh, that was a lot of frantic multiplayer. Yeah, my heart's still racing. All right, well, why don't we slow things down next week and explore some fantastical worlds? We'll take a fateful journey in a marvellous machine in far Lone Sails. And it's all heroes and villains on mobile in Marvel Strike Force. Now get out there and save the world. Plus, Dallas from Break the Future will drop in to show us his favourite game. That should be fun. Don't forget to check out what we've got online this week, including web exclusives and all our past live streams. And we've got new streams every Friday from 3.30pm. Until then, goose out. Rat out. Gem out.